Before starting, my dear brothers, uh, bishops, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, thank you for this invitation. And uh, before starting, I have uh, uh, the task uh, to, uh, to bring with me uh, the blessing and the greetings of the Holy Father. Uh, Friday before leaving from uh, Rome, uh, I have the chance to say to the Holy Father about uh, this uh, uh, Congress in uh, Sydney, and I ask the Holy Father the permission to, to bring and to give you his blessing and his greetings. And I said, Holy Father, may I? And he said, no, you must. You must uh, 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 say uh, uh, to all the participants, uh, to the bishops and the participants, uh, my, uh, my greetings. I remember uh, my visit in uh, Australia, and I keep uh, living uh, the memory of my visit in Australia. So please bring uh, my personal greetings and my apostolic benediction. And uh, also my greetings to, and uh, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to have also the nuncius uh, present here as uh, the uh, representative of the Holy Father in uh, this uh, country. My dear brothers and sisters, the new evangelization is a challenge. In fact, it is a great challenge that the Church accepts in order to confirm once more the presence of the risen Christ. We could find many different definitions of new evangelization. However, already in 1974, Paul VI wrote, no definition which is only partial and fragmentary, can provide an explanation of the rich, complex, and dynamic reality which is evangelization, without running the risk of impoverishing it and, in the end, of distorting it. It is impossible to understand it unless we try to embrace within our perspective all of its essential elements. We should avoid any misunderstanding. There is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom of mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, is not proclaimed. So, Paul the Sixth. And uh, he continues to say, the problem of how to evangelize remains always a current question because the methods change according to the circumstances of time, place, and culture, and hence create a certain challenge to our capacity for discovery and for adoption. In this apostolic exhortation, we are in 1974, we find important points which remain as fundamental elements for content of new evangelization today. The primacy of witness, the liturgy, the need to know how to use the new instrument of communication, popular piety, all of this from Evangelii Nunziandi remain in our time with a source of stimulation. From his homily in Nova Huta in June 1979, where for the first time John Paul II used the expression new evangelization, for 27 years the blessed John Paul II 
taught us how important it is to understand the significance of a new fervor, new methods, and new expressions. And finally, Pope Benedict wished to accept this challenge in a concrete manner, and uh, as we know, he has established the Pontifical Council for the promotion of new evangelization, and he said to offer appropriate answers so that the entire church, allowing herself to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit, may be able to present herself to the contemporary world with a new missionary impulse in order to promote a new evangelization. My dear friends, it seems important to state at the very beginning of our reflection that the church has not set out on the road of the new evangelization because she finds herself under strong pressure from secularism. But first of all, she does this because she wishes to be obedient and faithful to the word of Jesus Christ, who commanded her to go into the whole world and to bring his gospel to every creature. In this simple thought, we can find in summary form a project for the decades ahead. We must find us able to understand fully the responsibility which lies upon the Church of Jesus Christ in this particular period of the history. The Church exists in order to bring the gospel to every person in every age, wherever they find themselves. Jesus' command is so clear that it admits neither of misunderstandings nor of excuses of any kind. Those who believe in this world are sent out along the roads of the world to proclaim that the salvation which was promised has become a reality. This proclamation needs to be united to a style of life which enables the disciples of Christ to be recognized as such wherever they are. As long as the heart of Christianity is Jesus of Nazareth, encountering him will demand an impact which will allow people to see in his disciples a life which is coherent with what they announce. The road of the new evangelization is marked out. We are called upon to renew the proclamation of Jesus Christ of the mystery of his death and resurrection to call forth once more faith in him through the conversion of life. If our eyes were still capable of recognizing the deep significance of the events which characterize the life of our contemporaries, it would be easy to demonstrate how greatly this proclamation still occupies a place of importance. The area upon which we need to stimulate people's reflection, in fact, is the meaning of life, the meaning of death, 
the meaning of life beyond death, from those questions which attach human existence as such and which determine our personal identity, Jesus Christ cannot be excluded. If the proclamation of the new evangelization is not as strong in presenting the element of mystery which surrounds human existence and which relates us to the infinite mystery of the God of Jesus Christ, it will lack the effective power it needs to elicit the response of faith. It may help us to enter more fully into our reflection if we take up the words of the Apostle Paul when he wrote, you must lead your whole lives according to the Christ you have received, Jesus the Lord. You must be rooted in him and build on him and help firm by faith you have been thought and full of thanksgiving. Make sure that no one traps you and deprives you of your freedom by some second-hand, empty, rational philosophy based on the principles of this world instead of on Christ. The situation of Christian today, of the Christian community today, is not really very different from that of the first disciples of the city of Colossae. Unlike Christians from other communities, the life and the behavior of these believers gave Paul no cause for complaint. Rather, the news he received of them was a cause of praise, both for faith they had in Jesus Christ and for their witness of charity. Both the one and the other perverted their thoughts and sustained them in their hope, as can be glimpsed from the opening words of the letter. However, the apostle's concern is directed to the cultural context within which the believers are living. He fears that they may be easily deceived by new doctrines, by philosophies extraneous to his teaching, and by false ideas, which could lead to a form of a syncretism, such as to render null what is new in the gospel. The invitation he addresses to Christians, therefore, is that of being able to discern between what is true and what is false, between what which bears fruit and that which, by contrast, is a sterile, ephemeral. It is interesting to note that Paul reminds the Colossians, as the first point, of their profession of faith. Christ has been proclaimed to them. They have heard his word. They have welcomed the gospel and they have been converted on this reality with its various stages. They have built their life and they have developed a behavior which was as such as they enabled them to be recognized as disciples of Christ. The community, therefore, 
must remain completely firm in the proclamation made by the apostle without abandoning it in any way. In short, my dear friends, the transmission of faith of the faith is decisive because on the basis of that transmission are determined both fidelity to the gospel and the generous welcome given to it by all who come to faith. The four expressions to which Paul refers are particularly interesting and remain as an imperative for us too. To be rooted in the Lord, to remain firm in faith, to be full of thanksgiving, to take care no one deceives you. The firmness of the rock on which a Christian existence is to be built does not stand any contradiction to the fact that we must travel with constancy along the path in order to penetrate ever more deeply into the mystery. Planting and building, moreover, are cause and effect. And only in this way is it possible to build up the community without, with more and more new disciples. In the same way, that firmness is reinforced by the teaching which is offered to Christians so that they may not be tossed about and confused by widely disparate views about the meaning of life. The call to take care and to remain alert so that no one may be deceived is a real worry for the apostle. Not only so that his ministry may not be rendered vain, especially so that Christians may not fall back into the nonsense of life. And thanksgiving, finally, enable us to appreciate how much the life of the Christian community finds its profound and irreplaceable locus of meaning in prayer. It is not just a case of giving thanks to the Lord with the hymns and songs which are proper to prayer, but of giving expression to the time of the liturgical action with the fullness which is due for the gift of faith we have received. In a word, once more, the apostle places believers before the fullness of the life of faith, which is rendered explicit in the profession of prayer and witness. To be sure, we cannot hide away from the fact that now today there are many winds of doctrine which have shaken and which continue to shake us. The great problem of secularism has changed our society, our culture, our way of thinking, our behavior. There are some expressions of this which it, it is well not to forget in order to understand precisely the cultural context within which we find ourselves. It may be helpful to consider two such expressions. The first belonged to a philosopher, Martin Heidegger, Heidegger, when he wrote, the time of the night of the world is the time of poverty because it becomes even more impoverished. It has already become so impoverished 
that he does not even recognize the absence of God as absence. We don't recognize anymore the absence of God in this world as an absence. This is dramatic, believe me. And there is another sentence. It's Dostoevsky, one of the most prolific thinkers, as we know. He wrote, the key point of the question lies in this, whether a person imbued with a modern civilization is still capable of belief, of belief precisely in the divinity of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In this, in fact, lies the whole of faith. It's not just to believe in Christ, but to believe in, in this uh, very important person that we all, we know, Jesus, Na Jesus from Nazareth. Do we believe that he is uh, the son of God, the divinity, the novelty of Jesus Christ? During his uh, visit in Germany last year, Pope Benedict said, the absence of God from our society whites upon us more heavily. The history of his revelation, about which the sacred scriptures speak, seems to be located in a past which becomes ever more distant from us. Should we perhaps give way before the pressure of secularization and become modern by diluting the faith, of course, the faith has to be thought out and especially lived out today in a way which is new in order to become something which belongs to the present. But it is not the dilution of the faith which helps us here, but only leaving the faith fully in our world of today. Tactical changes will not save us, will not save Christianity, but only a faith which is thought out and lived out and knew by means of which Christ and with him the living God may enter into this world of ours. And finally, Always Pope Benedict, uh, it is asked, the question, which time it again lies in the center of dispute is, what is a reform of the church? How does it take place? What are the ways of bringing this about and what are its objectives? With some anxiety, not only believing members of the faithful, but even those outside of the church observe how those people who go to the church regularly are becoming older all the time, and their number is in a continual decline. How there is a stagnation in priestly vocations, how skepticism and unbelief is growing, what then must we do? There is an infinite number of discussions as to what to do so that this tendency may be reversed. Certainly, many things need to be done, but doing on its own does not solve the problem. The core of the crisis of the church is the crisis of faith. If we do not find a response to that problem, if faith is not revitalized to the point where it becomes a matter of profound conviction and a real source of strength thanks to the encounter with Jesus Christ, all the other reforms will remain ineffective. 
My dear friends, we cannot conduct a new evangelization without a new evangelizers. In St. Paul's letter to the Romans, we know what the apostle said. Who can be announced if there is, how they can know if there is no someone who will announce. At the root of our mission is the call and this call is to be an evangelizer. To be an evangelizer is a vocation. And this vocation makes all of us able, first of all, to hear the gospel of Jesus, to believe in him, to call upon him. This vocation is born on the very day of our baptism. And it is a vocation to every believer in Christ to make of himself or herself a credible bearer of the good news. To be sent is intrinsic to the baptismal vocation. This implies for all Christians that they assume this responsibility. Each one in their own person, without any possibility of delegating it to others. The proclamation of the gospel cannot be delegated to the others. Rather, it requires requires the awareness specific to the believer that he or she is to be a bearer of Christ wherever they go. We have evidence of this conviction already in the oldest writings. Cyril, the Bishop of Jerusalem, stated this in one of his catechises. He wrote, having received in, yourself, in ourselves his body and his blood, we are transformed into bearers of Christ. It's beautiful. My dear friends, the Christian is of his very nature Christopher, bearer of Christ. Only in this way can the words of the Lord, so rich in meaning they carry, be understood. Shoulder my joke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in earth. So our name is no more Reno, Peter, America, Mary, is a Christopher. If you are baptized, your name is Reno Christopher. You bring with you Christ. The first evangelizer, certainly, is the bishop. A successor of the apostles, upon him is conferred the mandate of being a living icon of the world of a courage and strong proclamation of the gospel. We cannot stay in silence. Our obligation is to announce the gospel of Jesus Christ. Priests participate and share with us the mission to evangelize, which is proper to the bishop. Together, we form a one presbyterate, that is to say, the single priestly body placed in the service of the people of God to proclaim his word and to keep it always alive. Priests are asked to examine the challenge present in the priestly life. And the first challenge that we are called upon to understand comes directly 
from our being a priest. The first challenge, therefore, is in order of reflecting upon what it means to be priests in the world of today, to understand fully our vocation. The priesthood, my dear friend, is not a matter of human achievement, is not a right as many today think. To be a priest is a gift which God makes to those he has decided to call to remain with him in the service of his church. To forget this vocational dimension is the equivalent of misunderstanding everything and to make of the priest an employer and not a man who undertakes a service marked by its totally gratuitous nature. A very special role is played by lay people. That is by all baptized who live the experience of faith in parishes, associations, movements, and in that incredible galaxy given by the action of the Holy Spirit. The document Christi Fidelis Leichen for 1988 is, uh, is very known and is a genuine uh, theological reflection for us. I would like just uh, to remember a sentence uh, from the Constitution, Lumen Gentium, where in the number 33 is written, lay people are called above all to make the church present and operative in those places and in those circumstances where she cannot become salt of the earth unless by means of them. Precisely this sentence, unless by means of them, should cause us to reflect on the specific contribution which lay people are called upon to make. There are settings and contexts which can be reached by no one other than by lay men and women who through their professional lives are in a position to give witness to the gospel. Their presence in this context is irreplaceable and only they are capable of bringing about the first form of humanization, which is often the necessary prelude to speaking about Jesus Christ. To enable Christians to recover their identity and their sense of belonging to the church can only be brought about to the extent that they recognize the needs to insert themselves into the way of the church and into her 2,000 years of pastoral activity. My dear friends, the first element for new evangelization concerns formation. This involves everyone with no exception. Formation makes it possible to recover the patrimony of faith and culture which we possess and which we are called to transmit to the generation we will come after us. This implies that we are capable of entering into the culture, of recognizing it, understanding it, but also of transforming it in the light of the gospel. Our presence can never be passive in front of the culture. The gospel is an active, is a form of language control in order to prevent us from manifesting our own positions. 
the second world link between the new evangelization is liturgy, which is the principal action by which the church expresses her very own life. From the very beginnings of the church, liturgical action has characterized his life. Then also today, we should be able to show that what we announce is concrete and real in the liturgical action. From baptism to funerals, everybody recognizes what potential they have because we don't speak just about a right. We are speaking with a coherent life. What we celebrate is not a right foreigner to our daily life, but precisely is directed to the question of meaning of our life. And then the third word, very important, is charity, our witness. Entering into this pers perspective equates to focusing upon the multiple concrete signs which the church continues to present, to be present in the world. Love, my dear brothers and sisters, must to be lived. We can be witnesses of the gospel if we love with the love of Jesus Christ. But in faith, we understand how God loves. In the exercise of charity, we made clear how he is faithful and coherent to be Christian. In a period such as our own, often marked by the closure of individuals within themselves without any possibility of having a relationship with others, and which delegating order to act often takes precedence over our own direct participation, remember, to remember our responsibility is very important. The person who is a chronically ill, the dying, the marginalized, the disabled, and the many others who in the eyes of the world express the lack of a future and the lack of hope find in the Christian one who is committed to them. We have many examples which recall in a powerful way the sanctity of men and women who have made of this program the concrete proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And with that, the beginning of an authentic cultural revolution. The conclusion. Turning to the new evangelization, my dear friends, into an empty formula is which anything and everything finds a place must be avoided. That cannot be. The expression needs to be understood and explained in a way which coherent with its proper meaning, because that is located in the foundation of the church's own activity. Even with all of the uncertainties and ambiguities which invest it, it appears to be the most suitable expression to indicate the need the church feels in this particular stage of history, especially in the West. The new evangelization, however, is not something alternative or parallel to what the church has done in the 20 centuries of her history. The new evangelization indicates 
a new way of fulfilling the same identical and immutable command of Jesus to the church to bring his gospel to all people. It is the proclamation of the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who in the mystery of his death and resurrection has redeemed the world, opening up to all who believes in him the gate of the eternal life. For this reason, we need to rediscover the foundations of our belief. It is the time for a new and mature apologetics of our faith to offer hope to today's world. We are called, therefore, to repeat with conviction the need to have ready the reason for our faith. Recognize that this needs to be done with a gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. Let us not forget that our contemporaries are characterized strongly by a sense of jealousy for their own independence and for taking responsibility for their own personal lives. They have become allergic to any form of authority and they suffer from the illusion that alone is true which is produced by science. So we find ourselves in the midst of an explosion of claims to individual liberty which affect the spheres of living out our sexuality, interpersonal and family relations, activities in our free time at the work. The space available for teaching and for communication has become cut up fatally in all of this and the entire context of life has been modified. But reducing to silence the desire of God, which has its root deep within us, will never be able to achieve true autonomy. The enigma of a personal existence is not resolved by denying the mystery, but by choosing to immerse ourselves within the mystery. This is the path to follow. As may be noted, the crisis is, a, first of all, a cultural and anthropological crisis. People today is in crisis. Therefore, it is necessary that we emerge from a certain form of neutrality into which many countries have enclosed themselves even to avoid having to take a position in favor of their own history. If the West is ashamed of what he has been, of the roots which sustain it, and of the Christian identity which still forms it, then it will not have a future. The conclusion can only be that of an irreversible decline of our countries. We Catholics will not be found lacking in regard to the responsibility we must assume, and we will not accept being marginalized. Our work of the new evangelization implies this also. We are convinced 
that our presence in the world of today is essential. No one else could take our place. Deprived of the significant presence of Catholics, our countries would be the power and would be less attractive. We do not wish this to happen. The hope that we bear as something extraordinary, great about it, because it makes it possible for us to look at the present, even with its difficulties, with a gaze that is full of confidence and serenity. It is the hope which does not delude because it is strong in a promise of life. God who loves and who forgives. Thank you.